Hey everyone, it's good to be back with another episode of The Normal Christian Life. We wanted to continue a discussion not necessarily exclusively on inner healing. There's definitely going to be a lot of reference to that, and it's very connected, but maybe just a more broad topic of of formation, particularly of what's called human formation, which some of you might be very familiar with that. Some people might not be, but um, it's the language that I know at least John Paul II uses. I'm not sure if it, other people have used it before then, but talk about there's these different aspects for a priest, but it works for the human person in general of there's different aspects to us to mature, grow, become more integrated. And so he talked about like uh, intellectual formation, which is pretty obvious, which we're familiar with in school. You learn stuff, right? Uh, there's spiritual formation. So that's obviously growing your spiritual life, growing in prayer, things like that. Um, there's pastoral formation, which probably would be a little bit, you know, geared towards priest, although there's ways you can view it outside of priesthood. Um, and then there's human formation, which um, yeah, Pope St. John Paul II thought was very, very important. And so human formation really is, yeah, just things that's not simply learning. And it's not just like, you know, praying. It's just these ways of uh, relating to other people. It's like things of how we carry ourselves, how we communicate. Could be uh, more of these like relational disciplines, but it can also just be like things of, uh, of, of exercise. It can even be something like your, your posture. It can be your mindset and it, it does connect well with things of, of psychology so uh not exclusively about inner healing but it is motivated by inner healing because uh we would like to continue just to dig into the topic of, of inner healing because as we said in the other podcast uh, on inner healing that it's it's really just such an important thing and some of the analogies we, zo- we use in that podcast is like you're trying to accomplish a task, you know, like have a, a winning football team or something. doesn't matter how good your strategies, your facilities are, even your talent. Uh, even someone could be, you know, actually physically tall. But if people are sick and injured, they're, they're just not going to be an effective team. And so um, as disciples, um, inner healing is so huge. So we just really wanted to kind of continue this conversation on inner healing. But I think we all felt this was like a good good foundation i know this is something joe was talking about was the importance of this podcast or just in general that we present like a simple a simple integrated vision of the christian life because uh joe you were saying how things just be kind of complicated and it can just seem like endless things you have to do and it can just seem complicated yeah so we were just having this conversation earlier before the podcast. And so kind of my whole point in my own words, I guess, just being that um, we really need a synthesis in the, like uh, a big picture um, when we're going through the normal Christian life. Um, And this should not be something that's only, you know, privy to um, those in formation as priests or deacons or, Whatever, but that's something that every lay person needs to have access to. Um, and so, and again, what do I mean by like a synthesis? Um, well, it's just this is something that I just am extremely passionate about: is um, people having a balanced and right ordered view of themselves as human beings, uh, a a a a, um, a, <laughs> a, a three dimensional anthropology, like a real sense of um, what what it means to be a, a soul and body creature in the world that God created us to live in. We're not angels. We're not um, we're human beings, and so there's a lot of dimensions to that because there's a lot of dimensions to who we are. But at the same time, um, it's important to gain a sort of a synthesis, a sort of a big picture that can help simplify that. Um, and um, it, it's it's not to try to put things in a box or put things in like I don't mean simplify it in the sense of like just have a black and white explanation of everything, but just to, you know, just to see things in their proper order. And a lot of this, I mean, a lot of my passion for this has personally come through my own, you know, inner healing journey and kind of seeing, uh, for instance, you know, 
how important it is to, in discerning God's will, for instance, to really be attentive to my heart, you know, my, my human emotions, even my body, you know, it's like you can't live in the present moment. You can't be in the present moment with the Lord as a human being and just ignoring your body, for instance. You know, you you have to be aware of your body. And, 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 and so there's just so many things like that that I think are not really emphasized as, you know, for Catholics. I think there's the lack of unity, the lack of synthesis. What I mean by that is, you know, maybe groups within within Christianity, within Catholicism, that just kind of emphasize just one aspect of it. And you you get enough podcasts, you get enough materials on all these different aspects of it, and then you just add them together, and then you just... It, it doesn't look like a unity oftentimes, or people don't receive it as simplicity. So it's like, we want to be able to live in reality, and reality is a whole. Reality is a unity. It's the reality... We want to see reality as God sees it. Yeah, and there can be a lot of excitement following like a conversion or the discernment of a certain vocational path, <clears throat> and people can just like pursue the Lord wholeheartedly, and they and they get really excited about, yeah, basically how the faith, how the relationship with God can transform them. And we, you know, we love to quote Romans chapter twelve, verse two. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And it's like, we do believe that like our our faith, our relationship with the Lord, and especially God's grace, like the Holy Spirit, can radically transform the way that we see things, can transform the way that we see other people, the way that we see ourselves. And we don't want to deny the, the we don't want to deny the power of God's grace to transform us. But sometimes... I think we we see that um, those spiritual resources, those spiritual uh, sources of transformation, scripture, the renewal of our mind, prayer, we see those as like an alternative to the hard work of human formation. And the way I think we are all wanting to present it more as like, no, the, the human formation, uh, the formation of our, our mind, body, our just, our, our ourselves as human beings naturally is, is something that always has to take place. And we do receive uh, additional grace and we receive tons of wisdom and insight through God's revelation to like, to know how to, how to be transformed, but we still have to do a lot of that work. And so I think there's um, I, I know we've, we've been talking in the past about just this, uh, Un, uh, this uh, false dichotomy between the human and the spiritual. And well, you're going to try to heal that or take care of that spiritually. Well, I'm doing it through counseling and through psychology. And like when Joe's talking about this synthesis of this big picture where everything fits together, um, we it's like how do we hold that together? How do we see you know psychology is valuable? How do we see you know physical health and, and nutrition or whatever is valuable exercise? Uh, just natural growth and virtue, like moral excellence. How does that fit in with prayer, int- intimacy with God? And so, it's a lot of different topics, like Joe said. But um, we want to we want to constantly connect them together because you're only one person. You are one person with I mean, you have uh, your one life, and you're in your and you are a soul and body together. You don't experience things. Some things as only as as a spirit, and other things. Uh, only through your body, everything is is something that you experience as a person, and we don't want to compartmentalize the faith and these different important themes and to treat them all like, well, this is more my thing and that's your thing. Uh, it's because we're all we all have the same human nature. We all need the same types of healing. We all need integration. It is a lot, but but it's it's beautiful to try to continually reference. I can cross reference these different themes because it makes it makes sense of like your experience. You don't have to have all these different camps, I guess, that specialize in all these things. Yeah, like some people might focus on the prayer of like, oh, I know this like these really powerful novenas, or like, well, there's this there's this particular saint and there's this particular novena. Or there's just one specific prayer that might be a little, a little bit more simplistic of the of approach but even like uh, other spiritual practices are good but just putting all your eggs in that basket and 
yeah look looking down upon as you mentioned like even exercise you know um and some people are really into the exercise and physical health and kind of neglect the the role of of prayer and meditation and things like that um and so for us just to present a the kind of foundational principles for being mature and i I don't mean just mature in like probably a i mean that in a deeper sense not just like hey don't just like dork around and tell silly jokes but a deeper sense of maturity just to focus on these principles because as we talk more about inner healing of like um you know lies and, and vows and um places of forgiveness and even even later on talking about other kind of more uh advanced uh psychological tools for finding inner healing such as like parts theory or, or inner inter- internal family systems just for us to um just be aware of like the the, the human person and um the you know mind body spirit how that's how that's all connected and not just have this like random list of things we have to add to novenas and certain prayers we do and just everything else a lot of this is is founded on this principle it comes from like medieval theology thomas aquinas saint thomas aquinas is probably the one who made it most famous which was that the idea that grace does not destroy nature but grace perfects nature and so it's kind of back to what i was saying before about like there really is doesn't need to be any dichotomy between like, well, is god going to resolve this problem or can i resolve this through prayer but but rather like recognizing that the the progress that it's is possible for me is in all ordinary circumstances is going to be limited by how i've also it's been healed naturally speaking. I mean, you can't have, you know, if you're just extremely physically unhealthy, it's just going to be really hard to thrive psychologically and spiritually. And so, um, I think St. Paul, uh, St. John Paul II and in, in his document on priestly formation talks about human formation is kind of like the foundational pillar. So human formation, uh, intellectual formation, spiritual formation and pastoral formation is something that we received in seminary and it was really drilled in, especially because early on in seminary, there's a huge focus on human formation. You have guys, a lot of, most of whom are 18, 19, 20 years old. And, you know, in growing up in a culture where there's uh, more immaturity at that age than there, there normally should be or would be. So there was a huge emphasis placed on, on human formation. So we, at least, uh, even if, you know, each person, each man would respond to that challenge in different ways, it, it, just because it's presented doesn't mean that you, you follow the advice or that you do the work of formation, but at least we had that framework of how important human formation was. And we were, we were being challenged daily to, to participate in it. There's a lot of people, and we know a lot of people who are uh, the way faithful and just meet we just meet a lot of people who are engaged in ministry and then the life of the church in different ways catechists uh, missionaries people who do speaking and all kinds of ministry and yeah i mean that just their their foundation their human found foundation it just it, the, the mileage can vary more because they haven't been given some like systematic uh formation program and um, yeah, we're not at this point. We're not like trying to propose everybody in order to be a, just a person in the pew should have to go through some massive formation program. But that work that we all have to do, like in seminary, for example, that is the same work that everybody has to do just as a human being. It's not like, well, for, for the lay faithful, human formation isn't the foundation. I think everyone can recognize that, you know, that that's like, that is the, the kind of the building blocks of of your human personality and God can do amazing things. But like if we're not willing to put in the work to, to be renewed in in the natural sense, we're kind of just almost asking for like a get out of jail free card. I don't know. It's like, if you're not, I don't, I really don't like the, the, the saying the expression, God only helps those who help themselves. Uh, I don't think he only helps those who help them who help themselves, but I I do think that there is truth in that in the sense that like okay you have to do what you can with what you've been given to to better yourself and somebody can have amazing spiritual gifts, uh, a lot of uh, 
just graces that they've received, but whenever it's filtered through a very broken human personality, a lot of natural wounds and things, it just can hurt a lot of people. They can wound a lot of people. And uh, I know we've all, we've heard stories of whether it's past scandals with different ministers and pastors and people, but how many people's amazing anointed ministries were ended by just human brokenness and human weakness. And it's like, uh, maybe the devil, (laughs) in a sense, the devil couldn't like, uh, went you know beat beat god's grace and at work in them but it's like they're just natural human human brokenness or their human weaknesses and how many you know team ministry teams and ministry groups have broken up because of just these bitter divisions and things so it's uh it's something that probably just we ignore a lot maybe uh, i know joe you were talking earlier maybe you can share more about just like that tendency to over spiritualize um there's just like yeah this you go ahead with whatever you're thinking. I just want to really briefly add, it's not just a matter of uh, ministry or, or ministers, like marriages, families. And it's not just, well, we'll just pray. We'll just pray, pray, pray. And again, we absolutely believe in continuous prayer, but it's not just like, well, we'll just say prayers and just everything my marriage and family you know, can be resolved. And, oh, here's the problem in marriage. Well, it's just the devil's just attacking us and... You know, I just got to say some like deliverance prayer. So I guess that'd be a good segue for uh, Joe, what you were going to say. Well, yeah, I mean, and even before getting into the whole over-spiritualizing tendency that some people have, I also want to comment on Father Chris. Um, yeah, it's just in Scripture, I mean, Jesus talks about that. It's actually kind of a key point that we referenced in our fasting episode uh, for Lent, which was the whole, um, the new wineskin, uh, and the old wineskin. So the old wineskin has already been, you know, stretched and it's stiff and it, you know, it's been filled with, you know, pride or whatever. And so that's like our, our, our soul or our heart. And, um, if you were to pour the new wine of the Holy Spirit and all of his gifts into a heart like that, it, it, it wouldn't be able to bear, it, it's, it's, it's not able to bear it. And again, we're spirit, soul, and body. So we're, the Holy Spirit doesn't just come and displace us, you know. It, there's some we are skins that need to be filled, but we're not ready unless there are some things that we, you know, um, we face. There, there are some hard things we need to do, and I, and it's not like, oh man, I just gotta go for a run an hour longer every day, like not something like that. It's like hard work, like forgiveness and breaking vows you know in 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 inner healing or yeah maybe some decisions with health and self-discipline and you know paying attention to our bodies more we're not avoiding like that hard to have conversation you need to have with like a friend or a family member yeah or and you know and this is like the way that jordan peterson has been a huge gift to many catholics i was talking to a catholic recently who came back to the church largely through Jordan Peterson, um, the Catholic Church. And so it, it's because you're, you are you know, talking about things like responsibility, t- taking personal responsibility. It's like justice, you know, those things are real. Those things are, are, are built into the framework of reality, you know. Um, so, um, yeah. So anyway, um, with over-spiritualizing, since that's come up a few times, um, and so to get to the topic of over spiritualizing, which um, it's already been mentioned, but like it's really just this tendency that I've noticed um, and that I've fallen prey to in my own past to when you encounter interior struggles, anxiety, um, basically chronic, you know, things within yourself and within your own life, chronic issues. Um, let's say, you know, maybe maybe a, there's a sin that a person continually struggles with or whatever there's this sense of like, well, I just need to be more spiritual in a lot of mainstream Catholic or Christian circles. There's a tendency to just kind of, you know, just put that over to secular psychology altogether. But um, generally speaking, there can be, that can be more of a tendency with either traditionalist Catholics or charismatic, um, you know, Christians to kind of um, maybe tend toward the sort of over-spiritualizing approach to, 
you know, psychological, emotional, uh, you know, even bodily uh, issues, you know, and, there, and there's a lot of ways of reacting to that. There could be like a victim soul mentality of like, well, it's like this, this is the way it's going to be. And like, but I'm just going to read more spiritual books and learn about, you know, more about the, you know, divine will and more about like, you know, um, you know, the mystics of the church and I'm going to be like them and I'm just going to, you know, and, and, and or, or there could be like a, um, and this was my thing, just, just an un- like, you know, an unwillingness to even face my emotions and just be like, well, I can power through the day with all these horrible feelings and like, just feeling like garbage. You know, it's like, I, I can still make it. Like I can still do what needs to be done. And this is, and this is what God's calling me to do. And I feel pretty sure of it. And I'm just going to keep praying and he's going to give me strength where I need it. And and the and the more it hurts, the 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 more holy you are. Oh yeah, it's like pick up your cross, your dang cross, and follow me. And that's what Jesus said. So I'm gonna do that. And and here's the thing with all that, it's just like that is a sure recipe for burnout and a sure recipe for you end up disowning your own heart. You lose heart if you do that. And and, and again, people well, people might push back and be like, but but you're actually praying. You're actually like like doesn't God answer you know prayers? Isn't this enough? And the fact is, over spiritualizing doesn't work because it's based in falsehood. Essentially, it's this idea that I think it's really related to Cartesian dualism. So I'm a, I'm not a big fan of the Enlightenment. There's a lot of really bad ideas that came out of that. One of that is the idea that we're like a soul and body, and that those things are kind of separate. And that as long as you're chug chug chugging along on your spirit soul juice your body is just going to kind of, you're just dragging your body behind you like everything's good. And one of the big things that we've been trying to explain on this podcast, especially with the charismatic renewal, there's been a huge emphasis on loving God with your whole being, you know, receiving him into your body, praising him with your body. So this is very much in line with what we've all been saying, but like the truth is it's like that that's just not enough. That doesn't give God glory for you to 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 try to to love him with your your spirit and to honor him with your spirit, but then just totally ignoring the physical and emotional part of you because some essential things are going to be left behind in that. Again, it's all based on a false understanding, a false understanding of the human person. We are a unity. Yeah, I just was coming to my mind is what Jesus says in John 10, 10, which is like, I came to them that they might have life and have it abundantly. And like, we rightly talk about how Jesus you know, a promise basically that that we would suffer and we would have the cross, that we would have difficulties, that we would face persecution. But so many Christians, like going back to Father Michael's analogy of the wounded football team, so many Christians are walking around terribly wounded, emotionally, psychologically, and even physically. They're not really able to to live like active lives that inspire people, not able to serve. They're not even able to do the things that they want to do, like that they would like to do for the Lord. And so we kind of just lower the bar to this, like this level of, of mediocrity, like on a human level, we're, we're not pursuing excellence. We're not pursuing virtue. And so, you know, we, we try to spiritualize the, the suffering that we have. Like when, and Jesus says that we will be persecuted, that we will have trouble in this world. I, he's not talking about just easily preventable problems due to our human negligence. Like, oh yeah, well, you know, Jesus said that, you know, like, blessed are those who mourn and blessed are those who are persecuted. Like, uh, Jesus knew that we would confront many difficulties and that life has, does have unavoidable sufferings but a lot of our problems are if we're honest with ourselves are self-inflicted and um that is uh, initially that can be very disheartening and discouraging because if all my problems are self-caused then i can quickly start to shame myself or blame myself condemn myself but actually once you have the lens of like inner healing and you see people who have been through you know that journey it's super encouraging because it means I can do something about it. Like if the problems that I face and the things, the obstacles uh, to my wholeness, to my well-being are all outside of me, it's like all my problems are extrinsic, like they're outside of myself. Then I'm just kind of powerless and you just go through life like, well, it's just, 
I just can't get ahead and I can't overcome these things. Once you realize like actually so much of my inability to thrive comes from, yeah, just maybe lies I believe about myself and ways that I've not embraced uh, whatever the, the things I need to do are to, to better myself. Like even just on a human level, it can be very empowering. I found it, I found it super encouraging and you can quickly stop I guess looking outside yourself, looking at the world, looking at things outside of your control as though these are all the problems and start to recognize like, wow, I can do so much um, myself. That's the whole theme, like you said, with Jordan Peterson, a personal responsibility. I am going to take responsibility for my problems. I'm not going to spend years and years of my life, waste all those all that time trying to figure out whose fault it is. And I'm just going to take up my cross, which means do what I can to do to bear what and has been given to me do inflict a lot of suffering on ourselves, and i do think we can offer that up i mean there's times i've like overeat eaten and been like tired and groggy you know and there's some discomfort there and like i can offer that up but like that's not like a cross i'm probably supposed to have on a regular basis you know um it does come from you know maybe even a type of imbalanced uh, indulgence so, I mean, I think that's an encouraging thing as well. One other thing I wanted to quickly say and just get it back to Joe here was just to say it a different way. I think sometimes we use prayer just simply just to uh, avoid the process. And it's like God's grace is at work, but it's at work in the process. So it's like, um, yeah, I mean, it's just if someone was really just even physically and healthy, it's like, okay, well, I'll just say a prayer and I just want God just to like zap my body and I just, you know, just get off all the weight, you know, reset my metabolism, like whatever it is, like, you know, why not just pray and have, you know, God just give me this zap. It's like, well, you know, maybe God wants to really uh, not just give, you know, <laughs> give a man a, f- a fish for a day, but teach a man to fish. And so, um, yeah, God could maybe magically zap us and give us health, but maybe God wants us to learn to be, you know, disciplined and reverent toward our body and attentive toward our body. And this definitely extends way beyond areas of, of health, but, um, we need sometimes God's grace to engage in the actual process. I think that's, uh, I think that's a really important point. So I think you guys, um, said that, but I just, that's kind of how I saw it in my mind. Yeah, to comment on that before I finish my point about over spiritualizing things, um, I think the pro the process is carrying the cross. That's the process. We have so much impatience and we struggle so much with just submitting to the process. But one thing that you can do, it's like <laughs> this is like honestly, I think this is kind of a gold nugget if I do say so. But I think it's something that the Lord showed me that like especially as a Catholic, you can do this and it is so, it's, it's, it's a joyous thing. If you are in the process right now and you are struggling with some deep and difficult thing that you're trying to work through, you know, it could be anxiety, could be, you know, chronic fear, chronic pain or whatever, but you realize there are things you can do about it and that you need to do about it. The good news is even though it takes, it's taking time, like you're doing your your part to work on it but you can also offer up every day for sinners for your own you know growth and love for the people in your life you can offer up the pain that that's causing you in that moment because you're not there yet so, right so you you can you can just be in the present moment it's like lord i'm i feel the fog of confusion and anxiety on me right now because i know i'm not I'm not fully integrated and, but I thank you for what you've been doing in my life. And I, I'm, I'm grateful for all that the healing. And I'm thankful that you've shown me how to start moving in this. And as for the suffering I'm experiencing right now that I can't really seem to do anything about, I'm just offering that all up. And so I think that's like just a very hopeful and like beautiful way to just kind of use whatever the devil wants to throw at us in that moment, just against him. Cause it's just like, we've got, we got the best of both worlds there. We got the healing that's coming. And then we also have, we have the, um, redemptive suffering going on. So 
Um, last thing I wanted to just say about um, over-spiritualizing, I think there's an assumption, and here's where I'm going to get, like, again, I'm, I'm risk sounding a little bit, a little bit harsher judgmental, but again, I'm, there can be, I think there's often an assumption, which is there, there's a higher order to spiritual things. And people who have, uh, who have orthodox theology are definitely, right, they grasp this. Um, and so with that, that idea that, oh, okay, well, I have to put God first and all other things will come, right? And, you know, there's like, like that's a promise from the Lord. It's like, right. seek first the kingdom of God. It does also say, and his righteousness, <laughs> all right? But it's like, seek first God, and it's like, everything else is going to happen that's going to be perfect. And it's like, well, yeah, but don't forget that the, that means in seeking God and his righteousness, that means you also have responsibilities. Yeah. And so it's like, um, just because the spiritual is superior to your, you know, that your spiritual faculties are higher than your other faculties, it doesn't mean you can bypass the limitations of your other faculties, your emotional faculties, your... Again, we've covered some of the reasons for that. I mean, it's a much surer path to growing in love that you have to carry the cross for a while, right? Learn to receive and give love in the midst of your weakness and limitations. So it's like, there's all kinds of reasons why God chooses to do that. It makes it a, a, a drawn-out process. But in any case... Like, we, we don't just read John the Cross for three hours a day, and that just fixes everything. I, that is, that's really a kind of a superstitious way to look at to look at us. It's like we're just not made that way. So it's not like the more spiritual stuff you read, the holier the people are that you read, the more you're just guaranteed that everything's going to just fix itself. Well, even even a man loving his wife and his family, that's a huge obligation. But it's not just like, Oh, I love you. I love you. I love you. So he might have a job. He needs to like take care of himself. He needs to like not be a slob. He needs to um, keep his commitments and things like that. It's like, oh, don't talk to me about goal setting psychology. I just love you. It's like, no, it, it really requires like to be a person of relationship and communion requires uh, self mastery. It requires healing and integration. Yeah, not everyone who says not everyone who says Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, right? But he who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. So just to like to kind of finish, I think there can really be a sort of a spiritual pride, just to get to the point, um, and an unwillingness to face corporal limitation. Um, that's really like I'm telling you, like that is a serious, serious danger. Um, I love how Jordan Peterson talks about the Luciferian intellect where it's like the self-glorifying intellect that assumes that because I'm smart, I can bypass any other limitation. And I've, I was a pretty smart kid, and I've been there, and I know what that's like to be there. And you feel like you're the smartest person in the room, so you have a right and a privilege to like bypass all the other struggles that humanity has. And obviously it doesn't work. And it's... It's really like <laughs> it's that the, the, it's just the fact is when you when you try to rely to 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 love God and worship God and do these good things but you're trying to do it only in the spirit while denying the body and and your bodily parts what you do is you either and usually it's a both and you become kind of demonic in the sense that you're you get unhinged from your humanity in a sense and you just fill yourself up with pride or there's you 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 lose your heart you lose sight of your heart you lose your access to your own heart um and that's something that i've been in too in my own in my own in my own walk and um i love like and this is like in protestant circles but like it's just very profound like particularly john eldridge and his emphasis you know in this in this book wild at heart for men talking about the loss of heart that happens when we disown our, disown our human desires. It's like, it's very, very common. And the heart is an essential part of, of who we are as human beings. Our vocation, our, you know, our happiness, our prayer life is so tied 
to being in touch with our heart. And so we leave that behind if we try to take a shortcut, you know, by over-spiritualizing. Something that's very deep and it was really hard for me to admit to myself, I think this is just a central problem when it comes to pursuing excellence, pursuing life in the spirit, uh, renewal of the mind, all these things we're talking about. It is the temptation to settle for mediocrity. And so when we do the, when we've done inner healing retreats for people in the past, I think there's a whole, it's not a whole talk, but there's a whole section of a talk called don't tolerate your brokenness. And I know for myself, the way this plays out is I, I had this great temptation to settle for mediocrity, whether it was on a human level or even a spiritual level. It, why do we do that? It's because we are afraid of our own greatness. So we are actually afraid of the unknown and the great challenge that pr- pursuing holiness, pursuing uh, sainthood will involve. And so what we do is, in various ways, often we're not even aware of it, we self-sabotage ourselves so that we can kind of find this sense of of purpose or like, well, I'm fighting this battle and I've got this cross. And so what we do is we settle for these puny little crosses that occupy all of our energy, all of our emotional energy, all of our time, all of our physical energy. We spend our life, we spend decades of our life fighting these stupid little battles that aren't doing anything to further the kingdom of God or to help spread the gospel. And we think that it's heroic because we're exhausted by it. When reality is we need to uh, ditch to get rid of these uh, petty crosses that we've decided for ourselves, like they, that somehow we've, without really discerning it, without going to God, we've decided that that's our, that's my cross. And we're not, and so we're not able to embrace the real great uh, adventure, the great cross that, that God has for us. It's not from the Lord. I'll use a personal example in my life. I struggled for years with abusing alcohol, like on and off. I started drinking heavily when I was 16, five or six years, just binge drinking, partying, really irresponsible and very deeply ingrained in me, even physically, like just this desire to abuse alcohol anytime I used it. And then through seminary, uh, just would, I went back and forth. Like I was a couple years where I didn't drink and then I would try to do it again and see if it worked. And it just never worked. Uh, it was always a, a constant battle. It was constantly, I was, um, drinking to excess, having lots of problems. It was causing all kinds of major issues for me, like psychologically with my formation, just like feel like I was making no progress. And I came to this, this deep, uh, awareness of like, this is not my cross. This is not my battle to fight. This is a complete distraction from the call that God has put on my life. And I'm wasting all my time and energy fighting this stupid battle that doesn't and I, and I, and I, you know, even, even measuring your, uh, your fruitfulness or your success, quote unquote, in your spiritual life by whether or not, oh, I did pretty well this week, or I, I, you know, I'm did a little bit better, you know, I'm, I'm improving slightly. It's like, it's, it's an, a lot of these battles are optional or at least, you know, they're not meant to, to, to occupy like a main place in our life. And that's just my encouragement from somebody who's just struggled with that battle of like, wow, it's, these are familiar challenges, so it, it feels it's much more comfortable to fight against familiar enemies and to get this sense of like purpose in fighting those little battles. I was like, what if God is asking you to do something way more important? And if you're gonna have the if you're gonna have the energy and the wherewithal on a natural level to confront that great thing that He might be calling you to, you can't be wasting your time over these stupid little things. Like, and I'm not trying to say that that they're always easy. Um, even something as simple as like, yeah, maybe I just need to really make my, one of my main priorities, like losing weight or becoming physically healthy. If I'm not healthy, if I can't even get through a whole day without, you know, really battling my, uh, my physical brokenness, how am I going to take on some great spiritual endeavor, some, some new challenge that God might be calling me to. So 
we're I love the quote from uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth at World Youth Day. He said, uh, "The world offers you comfort. You were not made for comfort. You were made for greatness." It's like we're constantly trying to just find ways to make our mediocre existence more comfortable or more, uh, you know, to feel content with that. And don't settle. Do not settle for a mediocre life. Uh, believe that God is calling you to something great. And when you believe that, what better motivation could you have for for pursuing excellence, for pursuing health and wholeness? It's like a father and his family. If he loves his family, he has this greatest gift that he could ever ask for, a wife and children. That's like the best motivation you can have to be healthy, to want to live, to to raise and protect and, and guide your family, raise your children. So similarly in our spiritual life, it, the best motivation when we know the greatness that we are all called to, it motivates us to, I think, take on these challenges of human formation and to get these petty little battles out of the way. Yeah, so Jesus says if your arm causes you to sin, cut it off. And to not just be tolerating these petty things that can distract us and yeah we end up uh we end up fighting we end up fighting the wrong battle i think a temptation for just religious people in general whether it's traditionalist or i'm actually even thinking more charismatics to be honest because there's real expectation in god's power um just to to only pray and uh avoid the concrete steps which i guess has been said but i i think a lot of times when we pray for something God's response isn't just going to be magically fix it, but he's actually, his answer to the prayer is actually going to give you inspirations of the Holy Spirit to make concrete uh, changes and and graces to engage the process. But, you know, the, the Bible does have, like, a lot of, of the wisdom literature, especially, like, Proverbs. It's not just like, yeah, just, just pray and all your problems will, will go away. It's a lot of practical wisdom and i even think historically it's still the canonical word of god but i think a lot of the things in the wisdom literature uh does actually come from surrounding cultures of like other even pagan cultures i don't know if it was more like you know greek or egyptian egyptian but there is worldly wisdom that was being had been passed around basically in those regions which, which again is not to deny the canonical inspiration but yeah, again, the book of Proverbs and other wisdom literature has a lot of practical advice. And so if, if people are wondering, like, well, you know, the Bible does say, seek first the kingdom of God and everything will be granted to you besides. And it doesn't, I don't hear all this stuff about um, human formation and, and engaging the process. It's like, well, it actually is in there, um, as I mentioned. Another little side point would be, <laughs> well, in ancient times, just people actually had uh, more human formation in a lot of ways. They were not isolated through technology. They were not like sedentary sitting inside all day. They were outside. They were in nature. They did manual labor. And so they they did avoid a lot of the uh, pitfalls we fall into. But we're living in an age that's more coddled and comfortable and lazy and disconnected and so we have to take an intentional effort to um, become fully human this might be a good transition to even talk about the importance of even the 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 brain the body and of course with that would be psychology so we've already been making references to it but just maybe just to more intentionally uh, address that so, like, I mean, one area, for example, I think is really helpful would be a sort of Catholic mindfulness. And I would love to do a full episode on this topic. Uh, a very, very influential book for me was uh, The Mindful Catholic by Dr. Greg Vitaro. And, you know, I think there are some Catholics, and we'll talk about this more later, that would be really kind of, you know, make their you know hair stand on the back of their neck or something or you know become uncomfortable when we hear this word uh mindfulness but you know i was reading spiritual book after spiritual book and they were valuable but it really shifted me differently to engage this type of tool i guess catholic mindfulness so again this is not the full topic but just say briefly about it it's really learning to connect with um 
one's mind, I mean, one's brain, one's mind, one's body, uh, being attentive to, just being more aware, being more connected to oneself, uh, learning to relate to one's thoughts in a different way. We have a tendency just to be carried away by our thoughts. We tend to identify ourselves with our thoughts of like, oh, I had a, a selfish thought or a lustful thought. Well, I guess I'm just a perverse, selfish person. And it's like, well, you aren't necessarily your thoughts. Um, and if it's using our, our body to engage in the present moment. And so these are just some of the, the principles of Catholic mindfulness that, again, at this point, I was in seminary probably for um, four years at this point. And the spiritual books were helpful, but the the amount of fruit, um, even reading the Mindful Catholic brought, was like disproportionate in, in a good way compared to uh, the other stuff because I did have a tendency to be more anxious and less aware, do things more mindlessly. I mean, this is such a huge thing. Such a huge thing for people is distractions and prayer. And I could just give normal advice on that, but I think mindfulness, one, actually would help you be distracted less, but even just how to relate to your distraction. People are like, well, I got distracted during Mass, distracted during Mass, distracted during the Rosary. And we just, it's just for people, it's just day after day after day after day, we're just going to try harder, we're just going to try to focus, try to focus. It's like this clearly isn't bearing fruit. And so, you know, why have this again? Is, is this something that was. Did Jesus talk about Catholic mindfulness? Uh, no, but as I said before, they lived in a different world that where they were not overstimulated. And um, again, they were maybe have as much toxins and things like that. Um, they just tend to live in a more mindful world. So there wasn't really as much of a need for it. And so this is something that's like when we talk about the, at the beginning of the podcast about integration, it's not just some magic civil bullet that this is going to solve all your problems. It's not just like, well, my approach to everything is mindfulness and my approach to everything is working out or prayer. It's like these things all work together. Like we're mind, body, and spirit. And so to know how to relate to one's thoughts and one's body and have a greater spiritual awareness, but even just uh, awareness of one's, you know, um, body is, is really huge. Yeah, one of the best, I think the best insights of mindfulness is that your attention is like a faculty. It's a, it's a capacity. Your attention, your ability to direct your attention, is, it's like a muscle that you can work out. It's not just, oh, I just happened to notice that this isn't working when I try to do literally anything. It's like you can actually take that focusing, that uh, ability to intentionally focus on something or have your attention directed at something. You can kind of isolate it uh, in different exercises where you're just like working out your sort of attention muscle. The Protestant pastor we've quoted many times before, uh, Michael Koulianis down in Orlando, he had this great quote I heard that said, um, attention is like gasoline. It uh, magnifies wherever you pour it, wherever you direct it. Like it, and, and, and Dr. Peter Craved in the, the foreword to that book, The Mindful Catholic, he said, you can't focus on God if you can't focus. It's like, it's it's no use saying, "Well, I don't need mindfulness. I'm just going to pray," or "I'm just going to pray." You don't need mindfulness. You just you or this breathing or exercises. You just pray the rosary. It's like, yeah, you can't do that thing. <laughs> like you you admit that you can't do it well. And if you don't have a if you don't have any problem with that, yeah, maybe don't make a huge deal out of it. But for people who constantly complain about being distracted, about having this racing thoughts, anxious thoughts, inability to focus, like all the other, it's like a, a for, they call it the military, like a force multiplier. It's like, if you do this thing, it will multiply all the other things that you're doing. If you can even improve your attention by 10 or 20%, like how much better would your memory be? How much better would all your reading be? Your prayer time would be more rewarding. It would be more delightful. Like you could actually find joy in prayer <laughs> because you'd be present to what God is doing in your heart and you're not constantly thinking about what you have to do later that day. You're able to actually just be in the present moment and savor it the way that a little child is. You know, and we said Jesus didn't talk about mindfulness, but he did say you have to acquire the heart of a child and who is more in the present moment and able to delight in it and not worry about 
uh, tomorrow's evil, you know, uh, to be able to be present, uh, children are totally able to be in the present moment. So in an indirect way, Jesus does uh, hold up and, and promote that ideal of like being just focused on now and not having to worry about later. Yeah. And the reality is, is like the enemy can provide distractions. Like he can, but it's just people so often, um, again, we want to avoid just saying, oh, this is all the devil. And we also want to avoid just say, well, you know, just doing these mindfulness things is going to fix all your problems because sometimes distractions come from a disordered heart. And then even, not even negatively speaking, sometimes distractions are actually something like God wants to talk to you about. And actually, so it, the whole thing about distractions is a pretty, actually pretty big discussion topic, but uh, people can just say, oh, I'm distracted. The devil's, devil's tempting me, devil's tempting me. Um, or people just, you know, beat themselves up and say they're so unfocused. And so, yeah, uh, a Catholic mindfulness could help with that. And even just like the body, like I've been on a, a pretty wild health journey and it is just so, such a giant impact on my, not how much God loves me. You know, God sees my heart, my desire to pray, and he's doing something mysterious. Even if I'm not able to focus, I'm showing up to pray. God is going to pour graces into my heart. But in terms of actually engaging in the process of meditation, reflection, sharing these things with God, sensing what he's saying to me, like I cannot tell you what a radical difference just having better sleep, health, and diet is for that. Again, uh, it's not an absolute requirement to be a saint or to be holy, but there is a, a value to the um, to the process of, of, of meditation and things like that. So even the body plays an important role in that as well. Just on the note of talking about attention, that's a fascinating topic, honestly, in and of itself. The, the power to focus attention is an incredible human power. I, th- there's this, that whole debate. I, I think it's an often over-spiritualized debate of spirit, soul, and body. I, I <laughs> Just thinking about it, I feel like this is kind of the human spirit in the sense. It's something that every human can do. Um, but it's also like the Lord, I think, can definitely give, you know, the spirit can strengthen that your your ability to, to 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 focus your attention and certainly help guide and direct it but but yeah like in my own like experience of of, of learning i guess certain mindfulness practices which again I, I some people just have struggle with the whole term mindfulness because it sounds like an eastern thing whatever it's really essentially what what i think what teresa Valo would call natural recollection yes it is um and so it, it is essentially what it is is um recollecting your faculties and being able to focus particularly on God in the, in in the prayerful sense, like you're focused on God and his will and his love in the present moment. But in any case, one of the things that I noticed that was fascinating as I began to learn how to focus my attention, um, was that I could actually know, I could track things in a way that I couldn't before. For instance, I noticed that, I can track the state of my heart by seeing where my eyes are directing themselves. So like you often don't know where your heart is sometimes in a given moment, but if your eye is, but pay attention to your eyes. Jesus does talk about this. He says the eye is the lamp of the body, right? So it's like, I'll notice my eyes are looking at people oftentimes. I'm like, why am why are my eyes moving in this way and looking at people? And I realize, oh, there's insecurity. I'm comparing myself with them, you know, and I, and I do that because, because I have attentiveness to my attention has grown to where I can actually look at what my body is doing. And then I can, I can learn about the state of my heart from that. So that, that's actually just an insight that just kind of struck me as I was sitting here that I've been starting to do this, but yeah, it's just so many doors to self knowledge can open up with something as sim- simple as practicing recollection at certain times during the day or like trying to and um obviously we believe christianity is the particularly catholicism but you know jesus is the way he's the way the truth and the life right he's the full revelation of the father uh full revelation of the kingdom of god but that being said do we think like every aspect of every religion and culture is just all completely evil like really like again i'm not i'm not a relativist uh, I'm not saying everything's 
the same. Everything is just its own pathway to God. I'm not saying that, but at the same time, it's like just every practice of every religion is completely vile. I would like to think that despite the imperfections and even even evil among other religions, I would like to think that God, that the Holy Spirit could work through other cultures and religions to have practices that are really fruitful, basically. And uh, I think it would the inner and the catechism talks about the interdependence of you know of cre- creation and creatures. Like I totally th- could see it being part of God's plan that although as as Christians as Catholic Christians we have the fullness of truth. I I would definitely see it the way God works that we would still have to humble ourselves in a certain way and, and, and learn from other cultures and certain things. Which again, this is not syncretism. It's not just like well I'm just gonna blend everything and uh, you know that 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 can be an issue, but. I would still like to think that there's valuable things about other cultures. Yeah, it's like what the theologians always called the the spoilia Egyptorum, like the spoiling of the Egyptians. Like, you know, they took all their when the when the Jews were escaping from Egypt when God was leading them out of, of slavery, they were taking all the the jewelry of the Egyptians to to be able to use it later to make vessels for the and gold and things for the temple. So it's like the idea that. Um, something that is naturally good can be repurposed for the service of God, uh, even if it was something that was used for pagan purposes. So, um, just kind of that. I just, I think it's just fear-based thinking. The idea that, like, um, yeah, something that w- was used by someone who was wrong about many things about God, like that, that couldn't be, there couldn't be elements of that that are good and true. And that's what the church teaches in the Second Vatican Council that. You know, I think maybe it's a Lumen Gentium. It says like, you know, whatever is good or true in in these other non-Christian religions is seen as like a preparation for the gospel, and the church acknowledges it as as good and true if it's good and true. I mean, if you can, by the light of your uh, human reason, can come to believe uh, with you know to know the existence of God, uh, surely by the light of your human reason, you can come to important insights about human nature, <laughs> like. Um, much less impressive. Yeah, and something else I think we should um, talk about is uh, the body specifically. And we have made passing references to it, but I think when Joe was saying we can be kind of dualistic or we can be like Cartesian, again, viewing too great a distinction between like the the body, you know, the body and the soul of like, the kind of soul is the real main thing. It's kind of like the driver in his body is just like this kind of like random thing that gets me from A to B that I have to kind of like put some food into and, you know, sleep every once in a while. So it doesn't like fall apart. That's like a Cartesian, Cartesian view. Uh, the Catholic view, it might seem like it's the same, but like the, the Catholic view would be that, um, the, the body and the soul are like two aspects of the person. It's not two separate things. It's like the two aspects of one person. So I really think, and you will always find someone on one side of the imbalance, but so maybe outside of the church, you might definitely find people, um, most definitely you'll find people who put too much emphasis on the body. And as we said in the other podcast on inner healing, just like everything's just a bodily issue or just help. It's just an imbalance neurotransmitters and just kind of, you know, throw a bunch of pills in your head just to kind of deal with these endless imbalance of hormones and chemicals and, and not always, and again, um, medicine can have its place, but we really have a tendency to avoid addressing the root issue sometimes, or why is there a chemical imbalance in the first place? But anyways, within the church, this is the point I'm, I'm making within the church as a priest, I see such a constant neglect of the body. And it's not like a guilt, trip or shaming people for, you know, eating desserts and, you know, not going to exercise as much as they should. That's not what I'm saying, but just really underestimating the role uh, of the body. Again, it's, it's, it's not just your kind of car that you drive around. Um, so your, your, your soul can get from over to house to over to work. Um, it's your, your, you as a person, you are a body animated by a soul. And so even like Thomas Aquinas says, like if someone's feeling like 
uh, depressed, he's like, yep, uh, take a warm, you know, take a warm bath and have a glass of wine, which again, is that effective? Maybe, maybe not, but it's, it's just an interesting point either way that this brilliant, very spiritual, very theological, um, teacher and saint just gave a very simple, straightforward, like human, um, you know, bodily advice basically. And I just, I cannot tell you, it actually, it was actually a real, it was actually scandalized me. It scandalized me as I went on my health journey and, um, yeah, a handful of years ago, I was just, you know, nothing like if I mean, it wasn't like cancer or anything like that, but just really feeling really sluggish, bad sleep, um, very anxious, mood issues and things like that. I, I felt like I was dying, which again, maybe I'm just being dramatic, but just f- feeling very off. And it was just, as I changed things with diet and things like that, it, it scandalized me how much that affected me, how much that affected my prayer, um, my my connection to God. And so I don't, fundamentally, we need to have a, a principle of, of interior freedom that like no matter what happens, we can always love, we can always surrender to God. Um, but that being said, you know, I was, I was, it was just such dramatic effect on on everything and so yeah a lot of people don't always have all the resources that we you know wealthy americans have to endlessly change diet and try different supplements so i do want to acknowledge that but to the extent that god gives us the ability to be good stewards of ourselves um just the body is, is so huge and there's a lot of i think there's a lot of issues with anxiety and depression that Maybe they want to totally go away, but just the the amount of uh, effect that stress and these things would have on people would just be dramatically and surprisingly reduced if they were just more uh, attentive to uh, attentive to their body. And so for myself, I prayed for healing uh, as I was going through that, and I, I really struggled like I just feeling horrible. I was basically kind of having like panic attacks in my sleep, and I was like, really like God, why are you not answering this? And the answer I got basically as time went on was just like I mentioned earlier, like, well, you know, I can give you a fish for a day or I can teach you how to fish. And so I really was extremely gluttonous. I was not necessarily extremely overweight just because my, I guess my body type, but uh, very gluttonous, very indulgent, very undisciplined, just and not attentive and and reverent towards my body. And so in terms of God's grace, like, would that be a better miracle if he just zapped me and just... I was full of energy. Uh, I think this is really beautiful about this pro- this kind of wrestling process because it's really, uh, one, it humbles me and helps me depend on God and it's not putting my identity in my performance. So a lot of good comes from that. But then it's, it's this deeper work of forming me in virtue. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, with the human being being body and soul, you could say that there's like this reciprocal relationship. So on the one hand, like Thomas Aquinas and uh, the, the church teaches like that everything that we know comes to us through our senses. Like literally everything that you know in your spirit, in your mind, in the immaterial part of you, it comes to you. It's filtered through your body. Everything that you experience is filtered through your body. So um, yeah, to the extent that your body is not in good health and there are things going wrong, uh, it's going to d- diminish or even distort your experience of reality. It's coming to you through like your, your filter is bad, basically your lens is bad. But also, St. John Paul II, probably his most uh, original and uh, kind of epic contribution to the church that he will be especially remembered for was his theology of the body. And he really emphasizes how the body expresses the person, like the body reveals the person. So our body and the way we carry ourselves, the way we treat our body and the way we even just move about and just carry ourselves is actually a manifestation or an expression of our spirit, of our interior life. And so, you can't have this dichotomous view where you say, 
well, no, I'm just like, uh, you know, everything is great. I'm integrated. I have order within myself. I'm at peace. Um, but I'm just like, my body is chaos. And I want to, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that people can't have like illnesses or, you know, severe diseases that are infectious diseases and things that they can't uh, prevent. But in general, if our body is just in a consistently terrible state and it's totally avoidable, that kind of manifests outwardly a kind of interior disorder. Or there's something is, is out of order. So as, as Christians, you know, we believe in that the body is essential to who we are. You're not a person in a body or a person with a body. You, you are your body. If you touch someone's body, you touch them. You're not just touching their body. Uh, but we, you know, we believe in the resurrection of the body that we'll have a new glorified body. But this body is what we've been given uh, as part of us in this life. And it's our only means through which we can receive and give love. We have to, even if we're speaking words, you know, over somebody, we have to use our mouth, we have to use our, our vocal cords. So everything comes to us through our body and we, we do everything, uh, outwardly through our body it's just it's so important and i think the catholic anthropology the catholic view of the human person is a huge corrective to people who who either totally disregard the body uh in and and destroy it like you see in especially in transgenderism and gender ideology that doesn't recognize the body as revealing something about who that person is but then also people who just they cheapen and dismiss the value of their body by using it in an instrumental way to for pleasure and things and basically just treating their body like it's just a tool for pleasure uh, that they can just use it however they want and just kind of dispose of it so uh, all those extremes can be avoided if we keep the you know the cl- classic catholic both and body and soul yeah i mean this is this almost goes without saying <laughs> I need to say it because we haven't mentioned it really, I think, but it's just like the whole fact that Jesus became man, that is something that I know I have not reflected on nearly enough. And I'm grateful for like the chosen, for instance, and we were just watching some of the episodes recently, father Michael and I, and just, just the way they, they kind of erred on the side of, of showing Jesus humanity more than his divinity almost. And, you know, it's like, it's like it was. It's worth. It's worth doing because scriptures make it clear that Jesus was very, very human. You know, on an emotional level. I mean, bodily. You know, just very. He's, he was a down to earth guy. Like he was not like. You know. Yeah, he says things in the, in the Gospel of John, but he's not just like up in the clouds and like disconnected from himself and his surroundings, like the Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus. Sorry, if, if some if people like that, but just. There is kind of a, you know, he never blinks in the series. And it's just like, that's just not very human. So I, Jesus was the most integrated person that ever lived. Mary, I'm sure, was very integrated as well. But like, that really, if we truly meditated on that, I think that would just really change the way we view our view ourselves. There's a quote I like from Father Wilfred Stinson in his book, e- Eternity in the Midst of Time. Um, he talks about just the importance of being connected to one's uh, rhythm, basically. Uh, he says, much misery comes from not respecting our rhythm. You cannot be yourself if you force yourself or are forced by others to follow a rhythm that is foreign to you. Constantly violating one's natural rhythm leads to an inner chaos. In the end, one loses one's sensitivity to his own rhythm and no longer has the ability to make a judgment if a certain work or way of working is suitable for his physical or psychological capabilities. Quoting Eddie uh, Hillisum, things come and go in a deeper rhythm and people must be taught to listen. It is the most important thing we have to learn in this life. And my, my favorite part of the quote is this, it is difficult to remain in contact with God when we do not take our own rhythm into consideration our personal rhythm is a concrete expression of God's will. If we are not in harmony with our rhythm, we are not in harmony with God. So part of this is about, you know, finding a way to, to work and use your schedule. But I think it's a deeper point of yeah, listening to, and being in touch with oneself, uh, whether that's one's body 
um, it's one's heart and something we've not necessarily talked about, but specifically, uh, maybe we could conclude here is just being in touch with one's emotions is really huge. I have such a power to really move us uh, in our lives and just to try to just throw them out to the side because they can be kind of flaky and chaotic sometimes. Like, well, these things are just kind of troublesome and annoying. So we're just going to repress them and not actually like reverence them and listen to them. So many problems come from that. And I don't know if you want to share just even if some of your testimony, Joe, of just how you did focus a lot on the intellectual. Like, I mean, you were reading like John the Cross and stuff like in high school, which I think is pretty, pretty crazy. I mean, like (laughs) in somewhat of an impressive way, honestly, but then, I mean, you've really read a ton of like mystics and things like that. And so, I mean, you just want to share a bit about like maybe just briefly about like that kind of imbalance of like so much intellect and head knowledge, but then maybe a real disconnect from um, your emotions and things like that. Yeah. I mean, just very briefly, I mean, there was, you can have an intellectual capacity to, um, they kind of absorb a very comprehensive and cohesive and you can integrate a certain framework, you know, um, John Cross was a very logical guy, you know, and, and so there's actually a lot of, a lot of his, you know, via negativa kind of spirituality logic, I was able to absorb and understand to some extent. And I thought it, it, I thought it was clicking for me, but it wasn't done from a place of deep prayer and cer- certainly not from a place of spiritual maturity and experience. And most destructively, I would say, um, was the fact that I was, I was reading it from a, a place where I was already out of touch with my own heart. Um, because I had in my journey, there was a period of time where I felt that my heart's desires were bad. Um, and that, God's calls were something external to my heart that I needed to conform to, um, rather than it was something that was my way of approaching it rather than seeing it as like truly believing that God created and designed me with desires that were meant to synchronize with his desire for me, which is, and that's a big, that's a big leap in trust to make. And the Lord has had to take me on a very difficult path, to be honest, <laughs> to really start to to receive that. But it's it is absolutely worth worth everything to be able to come to that understanding. But yeah, so I, I would say that. And I would just say too, just like on the whole point of emotions, um, attention, uh, paying attention to your body, mindfulness, all that stuff. Um, we've mentioned inner healing a lot um, at the beginning of this episode. This does relate to inner healing, even though we can't get into the, a lot of the specifics of that here. We've already introduced that topic, of course, but in a previous episode. But I just kind of want to point out, though, um, everything we're saying about the body, like I just want to show the connection here. Everything we're saying about th- these topics of the body and such, like, you have to be self-aware even to enter into inner healing prayer or even to enter into that process because inner healing prayer is not always just done in some you know room with a box of kleenex and like two ladies or something like it's 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 a daily process to be set free from lies and false beliefs that we grew up with and whatever and that's only going to happen if we're aware of ourselves if we're aware of when we're tense you know, to be able to ask the Lord, like, Lord, why am I responding in this way? Why is my body responding in this way? And that is actually like a sure, sure guide to true, lasting inner healing, because the fact is that our body often tells the truth when our minds isn't, right? We're often convince ourselves of things that we'll never be able to convince the body. You know, there's I haven't read the book, but there's the book, The Body Keeps Its Score, which is essentially things that happen to you, trauma that happens to you, will stay in your body. It's not something you can just wish away. So, And we've all experienced trauma. And essentially, trauma is the false interpretation. It's the false belief that, that 
kind of ensnares us and that it's that overlay that comes on us as a result of some, you know, something bad that happens to us. Like that's the reason why it, they wreck us. It's not because of the thing that itself that happened as much as the belief and, uh, you know, the lie really. Um, because again, the devil is truly at work in all that, in all of these wounds that we have. So yeah, it's just a roundabout way of saying like, this is, this is all connected. It's all important. Self-awareness, self-knowledge is vitally important. And a lot of that can really truly come from just listening to our bodies and being in touch with our, um, our emotions, you know, with our, our desires being curious and being um, simple in, in a sense and childlike with regard to our, how we're feeling in the moment. Just letting that, letting the Lord give clues to our, our healing path through that. Yeah. The lack of emotional awareness is absolutely huge. And I mentioned earlier, uh, just my brother and I putting on, helping do these like inner healing retreats and i think that is it the first two to i think the first two talks are facing our own brokenness the first two talks are on facing our own brokenness because even though we all experience like yeah everything's not going super well uh i'm having you know maybe strong reactions to things i think our bar again you know going back to the mediocrity thing i think our bar our standard for life is just way too low and we are surrounded by people who it's not again to judge them because we all are broken but we're surrounded by so many broken people who just have all this junk that they've not dealt with and we just kind of become desensitized to all these exaggerated uh, reactions to things these broken ways of relating to people broken ways of of loving and receiving love and we don't we lose sight of like we don't have any concept of what else could be possible i just thought of the analogy of like color blindness and if you don't have it's really it was really whenever i started to spend time with a couple of people who had been through uh, a huge inner healing journey that i recognized some of it took that for me to recognize some of my own brokenness I just didn't have any, like, I wasn't really experiencing people who didn't kind of deal with things this way, especially going to seminary and encountering men who were a lot more integrated than me and then also some other friends uh, in, in ministry. But it's like, you know, if you're colorblind, you just don't have a, a concept of, like, how else can you <laughs> interact with people? And so um, definitely just a shout out for the importance of, of friendships and finding those people who are, you know, more integrated than yourself, who have maybe been through a lot of, of this integration, this have more human formation, have more uh, progress in their inner healing, because it gives you a lot of hope. Uh, it's like a living testimony to what is humanly possible and, and spiritually possible for integration. Yeah. So to conclude or to sum up, um, yeah, I just think that with this whole kind of episode, um, one of the things we want to do is to just hopefully present a bigger picture, kind of fuller aspect of, of what we're talking about with the normal Christian life, how there needs to be a well-rounded anthropology, really, um, for the way that we're approaching it. Um, and specifically, too, um, just to mention, like, you know, especially in future episodes where we might talk about inner healing, um, you know, renouncing lies, uh, breaking vows, um, maybe deliverance, um, ways to go about uh, deliverance from evil spirits. It's just um, to really steer clear of the pitfall of believing that um, if you follow this, the right formula, um, if you just have enough faith in the moment and you just say it the right way, it's a one and done. Otherwise, if you still have problems, it's, it's a failure. You know, it's like, no, it's like everything is within the context of, of the process of the, of the fuller process. And the more, the more you're, you're content to, to continue to just do what you need to do in the present moment, um, throughout your life to live a fully integrated life, the more lasting and the more, you know, profound that healing is going to be that you need. So, um, yeah, that's, and I'll also, also let all of you know that anthropology is the word we've been throwing out a lot. 
it means the study of man. So it's like understanding the human person. So these things of of intellect, will, imagination, memory, uh, the body. These are the things we talk about anthropology. Um, it is it is important foundation because um, if we're, if we're going to be fully human, if we're going to be fully alive, if we're going to be fully integrated, we have to really understand what we're working with. And we're again, we're not just a kind of an uh, an angel who's trapped in a body, and we just got to say prayers, as we've said uh, many times. But yeah, I would look, definitely look forward to just exploring these topics of, of finding really a greater integration and healing. Uh, as because as we said before, like when when we are healed, like we'll be able to connect with each other and certainly be able to connect with God in a deeper way. We'll be able to more easily receive His love and share that love with others. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, I ask you just to uh, reawaken our hope, our, our hope and faith, just to desire the more that you have for us, to not settle for less, to not just desire a, a life of comfort, to, to help us to not avoid the process that we would dig into um, our negative response pattern, our negative thinking patterns, our uh, unrenewed attitudes, our, our disconnect from our emotions, our disconnect from our memories, our disconnect from uh, our bodies. Lord, help us just to engage um, the worldly wisdom and resources, uh, whether that's practical advice to the scriptures, whether it's um, any other resources, just help us to engage everything that's uh, available to us and you've just given us so many amazing resources help us to journey with you in this process of wholeness help us to, to, to journey with you in this process uh, of formation that we would uh, there would be saints who'd be just whole uh, saints just integrated with their uh, emotions uh, and bodies and, and minds and and in, in every aspect of ourselves, we, do, we just live this uh, integrated life. Amen. God bless you all. <laughs>